You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. Uh, we have our uh, such a, a, a good friend of the program, Corey Shockey, uh, with the Hoover Institute and the Army College, and um, she has a great piece here, and I can't wait to discuss it. Corey Shockey, it's great to have you back with uh, Brett and John here. Hi, gentlemen. It's so nice to be back with you. It is. Uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, piece that you have uh, in Foreign Policy magazine, and uh, that was yesterday, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, you raised some really good points, and I, I want to just throw this one out there, and I think it's really the most important point, not just for, for your discussion on the Army or the Armed Forces, but just in general for our national security. Why is it that we justify our national security based on a budget and not just assess the real live threats that we are facing and come up with a proper plan and then provide the budget to ensure that we are doing the job of really what the federal government was supposed to do. And because, you know, the people on the own, the towns on their own can't do these things. That is the most important thing that the federal government does not to tell us what to do in our schools and what to do in our uh, backyard and, and all the other things that they get involved in. And so I think you, you raised that point, and you're, you're talking about you know a lot of different issues here. But why do they always work backwards in this budget process? <laughs> well, I think it's true that every strategy is really a budget drill. You know, I'm a big fan of strategy in the Eisenhower administration. And one of the things that's really interesting, if you go back and read the National Security Council debates about what to do in 1956 about the Soviet threat, the Secretary of the Treasury and the head of the Office of Management and Budget were both in the meetings and rejected the Defense Department strategy as being too expensive and said, go back and find a better way to do this. You know, we need a different way than we're doing. And so it's not that strategy is never constrained by budgeting. It always is. It's that DOD somehow is has worked itself into a mindset that the amount of money that Congress is going to give it isn't the amount they're budgeting to. And so they're making the constraints actually a whole lot worse than they need to be by pretending that sequestration isn't going to occur and by creating a budget that's fifty billion dollars more than Congress will give them. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I, I suppose it seems to me that uh, as we've had troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, that even though we've had a military budget, I believe we've appropriated more money at times to pay for things such as uh, you know helping to rebuild or, or uh, provide uh, infrastructure in those countries or, or other. Uh, sources. So Absolutely right. The biggest – I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, it's, no, no, that's okay. I was going to say, is it possible that they're just kind of figuring that into the equation? Yeah, and you raise a really serious and important point, which is why I leapt up with my, with my hand up to answer, um, which is <laughs> that the Defense Department has become the major source of U.S. foreign assistance. And that's not good. It's not good for how we look to the world. It's not good for actually developing economies. It's not good for the civil military balance inside countries we're trying to affect. And let me just give you the most egregious example. The United States government gives $1.3 billion in military assistance to the Egyptian military, and we give $250 million dollars in foreign and economic assistance to the government of Egypt. So five times what we give the government for democratization, for uh, helping buffet their transition from a subsidy economy to a more open market economy, all of that kind of stuff is one-fifth the amount of tanks and training and military assistance we give Egypt. And that sends signals to countries around the world that the the balance, and also that we don't use our diplomatic and economic tools. We principally only use our military tool. Um, 
That that's a great point, and you know I'm glad that you brought up Egypt because I, I would I'd like to get a little bit more into this uh, article that you wrote uh, if we can. But at why you brought up Egypt, I find it actually fascinating that the people took to the streets again, and and I, it's almost as if we're going to do this until we get it right because they're clearly not happy with what the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, was doing. They're clearly not happy that so many different minority groups within Egypt Mm -hmm. weren't being Mm -hmm. treated fairly. And I think at at the end of the day, they said, we know we could do better and we're going to, and regardless if the United States is mad, or at least this administration is mad at us because we're not leaving their people in place. But I find it fascinating. And I I actually, I I mean, I think all of us are rooting for a good result in Egypt. And I I think maybe we'll get there, but it's going to be a tough struggle. Boy, I sure agree with you, and I'm, I'm, I think, maybe a little bit less confident than you are about the recent, um, about the recent decisions, because what it looks like to me is not a reestablishment of democracy. What it looks to me is like the military taking over the government again, and I agree with all of the criticisms. You know, 20, 16, 20 million people turned out protesting the choices that the Muslim Brotherhood was making in government. And that's the equivalent of about 70 million Americans protesting something our government's doing. I mean, the scale of that is is monumental and really important. But at the same time, what they advocated was the military taking over the government. And Egypt has seen this movie before, and it never ends up with democratic governance. And so I'm quite worried, for example, that the general who led the coup has now made himself deputy prime minister. Um, And the military remains, its budget and its practices remain beyond the control of civilian government. I worry a little bit that the liberal forces have made a deal that they're going to regret, and it was an expediency deal. Namely, they were afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood, and there were lots of good reasons for that. But the Muslim Brotherhood did actually allow itself to be constrained by the institutions. When Morsi uh, promulgated his decree in November that would have put him beyond the reach of the courts, um, both the courts, they've you know, an institution of democratic civil society uh, rejected it, and Morsi respected that the courts got to set that boundary. He didn't. The military has put itself beyond the reach of the courts. And the Muslim Brotherhood, as inexperienced as they were, as bad as they were, did not put themselves beyond the reach of other checks and balances and governance. So you're right. This is a difficult transition. It, there, it was going badly. It's still going badly. <laughs> the potential to even go a lot worse because what has now happened is that the military has said, no matter who gets elected, uh, we set the boundaries of the political game. It didn't let the law do it. It didn't let elections do it. The military did it. And remember, there are no, I... as many Egyptians who favor the Muslim Brotherhood 20 million and would vote for Morsi again as we're out in the streets protesting him. I, I think you bring up some, riven society. Uh, yes, I, you bring up some very valid points. I, I think I would say, and, and of course this is my feelings on this, I think that democ- straight up democracy isn't necessarily going to work in Egypt or a lot of other places for that matter. I, 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 I'm a strong believer in what we have here when, when we actually follow it and that is the the republic form of government, the democratic republic. And I think Mm -hmm. that eventually, hopefully, they will move really towards that form and system. But I honestly, I don't know. I I just get this feeling after watching some of the other countries around the Middle East that I have a little more faith in the Egyptian military right now than an extreme wing of anything in any of these countries right now. And I I think that, you know, I hope... I hope that it plays out the way I feel. Let's just put it that way. No, I think it's really important, and there's a lot of merit in what you say. The only 
the thing that makes me less confident about the Egyptian military and more confident about strengthening in democratic institutions and processes is that what you see in societies that are coming out of decades of authoritarianism is that the first elections go to the groups best organized. And in Egypt, that's the Muslim Brotherhood, because they were the unofficial opposition for 35 years. And, you know, they put two people, newly, newly freed political prisoners, they put two of them on a bus to every town in Egypt. They got off and said, my friends, I've been in jail for 20 years for advocating the political rights that we now have. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood's on your side. My mom would have voted for those guys on that basis. And in power, they they clearly have an undemocratic agenda. And they they want to be in a place where majority rule defines the nature of minority rights. And that's not something Americans can feel comfortable with. But what you see in democratizing societies is that the you know, people everywhere are kind of the same. They want schools, they want sewers, they want... And what I believe I was seeing in Egypt was the Egyptian population set up with the fact that the Muslim Brotherhood wasn't good at governance. And if the next elections, the parliamentary elections, had been, out, been able to play out, I think you actually would have seen elected a more moderate, less Islamist majority of parliament to balance Morsi. That's where Egypt. That's where all of the polls about Egyptian public attitudes were headed. You know John. the irony, uh, and and uh, Corey, I have to apologize. I'm um, I'm here uh, driving in the car up in uh, D.C., so I'm actually looking at <laughs> our nation's capital <laughs> and the horrible traffic uh, that oh, you have sorry. to face going through here. The beautiful thing is uh, I, I have my lovely 17-year-and-a-half-year-old daughter who's an amazing driver and a great co-pilot, but uh, D.C. is a bit confusing when you have traffic. <laughs> and people, Boy, what a big traffic is, just chaotic is to drive Egypt. her dad around. So, oh, I don't you know. know. Have you ever driven in Egypt? I think it's actually much worse than Cairo. Uh, you know, it, it probably is, but having having been in parts of China and parts of India, I, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> you, you couldn't... When everything is chaotic and nobody follows any rules and stoplights are at best an option, then you know, that's you know, a how, fantastic how much more chaotic metaphor. can it get? That's a you fantastic know, I, metaphor for democratization, actually. Well, well, it is. So this is what I want to say. I, I agree with a lot of what you said, but I don't think th – there's no right or wrong. I think if ever there's a situation where there is clearly no – simple binary right thing to do. I, I look at a handful of trend lines. So I actually was very comfortable with what the military did, and, uh, and, and I'll tell you why. First, because I would like to be optimistic about the multiple layers of a democratic process taking shape. However, when the Muslim Brotherhood was not only putting institutional uh, uh, steps into, into place that could very well have just guaranteed we had a theocratic regime that was you know, dead set against everything that we stand for in democracy. You know, the old, you know, we're democratic for one election cycle. Um, but the fact that they were creating a level of additional instability in the Middle East, that was very problematic. And, it, and, and putting itself on a, uh, let's just say, taking the entire Sinai Peninsula and putting a time bomb underneath it. And I think that was very... Uh, very, very uh, problematic, especially because with what's going on in Iran and in Syria, the last thing we need is another giant, um, you know, kettle that might blow. Now, you know, I the have military, to tell you, I think we have that yeah. with or without the military taking over the government in Egypt. Well, there well, is a big that, problem in the Sinai, and the Iranians are a big problem, and Egypt is now going to fester as it probably would have festered towards democratization, it's now going to fester as the Muslim Brotherhood goes underground and reverts to violence. Oh, well, th now that's a great point, but, I, but let, me, let me give you, I don't know if it's a direct counterpoint, but the, the military, this is very interesting, the military has been, even throughout Mub Mubarak's regime, it was very clear the way he fell that ultimately the military has been to a large extent in control for a long period of time. And part of that is because the military owns the economy. The military is, in many ways, 
uh, very similar to the Chinese, a managed uh, a managed You're exactly economy. Exactly right. They control thirty percent of the Egyptian GDP. But yeah, the military they, which controls thirty percent of, of the overall economy. Yeah, but now so here's so here's my point. There, you have two opposing problems in in Egypt. On one hand, you have people who are who, who are just devout. Uh, and, and in many cases radicalized Islamists. And on the other hand, you have people, as you describe, the bread and butter crowd, the ones who just want jobs, just want schools, just want their, want their kids to be, uh, uh, to be okay. And if the military does its job and helps to keep the economy afloat, that's your point about we need to have less money going toward the military and more going toward things that help create jobs, I think there's an option of stability. But the main thing missing, I believe, in all of this is external leadership. You know, our leadership has been questionable at best, and what the military really needs right now is not somebody who's publicly chastising them or standing on the sidelines, but somebody who's helping to make the point that right now it's all about the economy. If the majority of Egyptians feel that there's not only a transition in play, but that they may actually have a stable economy, jobs in the future, that's a lot less people who would jump to the radical camp. Yeah, let me take those two points uh, separately because I both think they're really important, and and I myself need to build more intellectual capital on it, and I think it would contribute to the broader debate hugely for, for all of us to think carefully about it. On the economy, I agree with you that the more that – people are worried about just bread and butter issues, the less they tend to be politically radical, right? That's, that's the undergirding of the Marshall Plan, um, that economic prosperity brings political stability and, and playing by the rules that the United States feels comfortable with. But the Egyptian economy isn't newly a mess in the last 18 months, in the last year when when the Muslim Brotherhood was running the government. The Egyptian economy has been a mess for 30 years while the military was in control of it. So it's a rentier economy. They are, it's an extractive economy. They're not creating jobs. The, the dead hand of the military on the Egyptian economy is a big part of the problem. And they have no intention of, of letting free market principles intrude on that. And I think part of the reason that, that they moved against an elected government was to preserve those privileges. So I'm not, I have less confidence than you do that the military means either a return to economic stability or greater prosperity. You know, the, the crushing subsidies that have been in place um, in the Egyptian economy have been there since the 1950s. The military never moved against them. Um, and I don't think they will now. So, so I don't think the military is going to solve the economic problems. I, on the other issue, our leadership, boy, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, it's, it seems to me illustrative that when the Deputy Secretary of State, Bill Burns, went to Cairo last week, neither the Muslim Brotherhood nor the liberals wanted to meet with him. We've managed to actually alienate both sides of this by being publicly critical and privately unhelpful, when in fact we should be doing the reverse. In fact, we should be talking about the rule of law, free economies, um, the checks and balances of a democratic system, that that's what makes us prosperous in the United States, and we don't see another formula that gets countries there. Um, and... Right. Uh, nobody wants to hear it from us at the moment, and I don't blame them. Uh, you know, Corey, in, in all fairness, we didn't want them here either. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring up a point, a, a little, a, a slight twist to our conversation here, and I think it's important. When we started off as a nation, you know, we, we made the decision to have a revolution against uh, you know, the, the world's greatest power at the time. And what an incredible risk. People that took upon that risk were a good people with a good cause in mind. And we had our problems at the beginning, uh, you know, clearly. We, we had, uh, you know, take a few stabs at coming up with 
what was eventually institution. And, it, you know, we had our, our hit there, but I think the fact that we were a good and educated people who were determined to get it right made the difference. And so when I compare that to what's happening in e, where we could say, well, you know what, we really need to give a country the time because it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, no country is going to have a, a complete mm-hmm. radical change of government, and then within two months everything's going to be A-OK. It's going to change, and, and we understand that. But that being said, I truly don't believe that the Muslim Brotherhood or, or a lot of people within that sect or system or, or, or type of thinking has the right intention for what really works for uh, a true democracy. I think that's right. I mean, I, Jim Mattis, the former CENTCOM commander, very often says that the only difference he sees between radical Islamists and and those who are running for office is the time frame on which they want to bring about their majoritarian view. And and there are lots of reasons to be distrustful of what they want, right? Like, just for one, as a woman, I wouldn't want to live in a society that viewed my freedom as different from you fellas. And I'm sure you wouldn't want your 17-year-old daughter to either. But the... The reason that democratic institutions matter so much is that they give you a testable proposition, right? The parliamentary elections in Egypt um, were the way we would know whether what Egyptians thought about things. And allowing, setting the rule of law and the rules and institutions in place of democracy actually reduce mm-hmm. people's fear and focus on governance. And you see that everywhere that elections are routinely held. And so what isn't important what isn't important isn't so much, you know, the the voting in an election. It's the fact that this is how you determine public preferences and and people have to and governments have to respond to them. And so I'm more confident I, I absolutely agree with you that Egypt is on a very rocky course, there are lots of reasons to be distrustful of the Brotherhood and of their Islamist agenda for Egyptian society. But I do think the only way to defang that is to have a political process that they can participate in and try and make their case. And those of us who disagree with their principles, their philosophy, with the kind of Egypt they were trying to create can organize and get on buses to towns all over Egypt and try and say, don't you want your daughters educated? Don't you want her to have the chance to run her own company? Um, And win that argument. But what's happened now with the military taking over the government is that what the Muslim Brotherhood, which continues to represent 30% of Egyptian public, um, public support, what they have now been told is that the rules change when it comes to you, that winning an election isn't good enough proof that you get a chance to try and do what you want to do, that we always get to trump you out of power. And that means that they're not going to choose to participate in elections. It means greater likelihood of sectarian violence. It means greater likelihood that Egyptian government ministers' cars start blowing up in IED attacks because you've given them no way to participate in a process by rules that apply to everyone. And that's my long-term worry for Egypt right now. And, and it's, it's – well, not funny that you say that, but it's interesting that you say that because I had the same thought when I saw some postings in, in social media over the last week or so stating that the new government's made up of this group, this group, this group, but not the Muslim Brotherhood. And I actually, yeah. as much as I despise the Muslim Brotherhood, actually felt that that was – potentially a mistake yeah and i think it's so the the army is claiming that they offered cabinet positions to the brotherhood that they wouldn't take but if you're the brotherhood and the top 18 members of your organization are under arrest with no charges and being held without being held incommunicado your media outlets have been shut down. Your finances have been shut down. Why would you participate in that government? Right? But most likely they won't. I think, you're going to be the right on that one. 
And so there's, there's one other thing it, I could say, though. If we could, yeah. You, you mentioned before, earlier in our conversation that, you know, the military doesn't always necessarily make the best decisions for the economy. And I agree with you 100 percent. And I think as an example that we see here in America, neither do the politicians. I think in the case of what's going on, not just here, <laughs> not, not just here in our own country, but in Egypt, they really need some businessmen who have international experience in not just, you know, within banking, within uh, larger industries that where they could actually bring, uh, you know, jobs to their country that, that could possibly develop yeah. and grow, not just – not just like a, a an exiting market <laughs> or a non-existent market, you're, but I really do that. You're exactly right. Show. You're exactly right. Economies prosper when governments set predictable rules and then stay out of business. They, it's not a complicated economic theory. It's a basic arithmetic equation. You have to have the rule of law. You have to have pr- some predictability, and the government needs to not play favorites. And as you very rightly say, the Obama administration has not been doing very well at that at home. Well, there's two connected points I wanted to make here. One is you're, I think you're spot on. Part of the big problem that Egypt has has been they needed a growth economy. Why? Because like much of the Muslim world, the population in the, in the Muslim world growth is very, very high. You know, it could be three and a half, four, four and a half, five. I think Egypt, Egypt if I recall, was like 4.3 or 4.7, somewhere in that range per uh, per couple. Mm-hmm. So you have this explosion in new young people who have uh who have no jobs and the only way to get those jobs is investment and investment only follows, like you said, the rule of law or as I would say in business terms, predictability and stability. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's a huge a huge issue. And the the, the second thing I'll, I'll, I'm gonna throw two in so I don't have all the background noise and I'll ask you respond to both. The the one thing I also want to touch on is I think Part of what made me really happy about this is there was a huge, you know, there, there's, this, there's this giant thing that wants to explode in, around Israel. And Gaza is one that really needed to be contained. And under the Muslim Brotherhood, Gaza was getting, in, in my opinion, worse and worse. And you were seeing a lot more radicalization on the Sinai Peninsula. And the the fact that you had a separation in, because of Syria between Hezbollah and the basically the Shiites in Gaza, and simultaneously now the Muslim Brotherhood is no longer able to support them, I think you might be removing attention on the southern front that will be critical to help maintain stability so we can address Iran and Syria. So I'd like you to speak to both those points mm-hmm. if you could. I agree with your analysis that um, Hamas in Gaza has been a real force for evil, And most principally, the people they have hurt are the people of Gaza. Um, By Israel gave them an enormous opportunity when it withdrew from the West Bank and Gaza. And if they had focused on governance, on proving that a Palestinian state can work for the people of Palestine, we would be in a whole different universe of activity there than we are now. But instead, what they did was resort to retribution attacks into Israel. And that fractured in the Israeli public what was a widespread belief, a widespread support for trading land for peace. That's where the Israeli public was on on Palestinian issues at that time. And it was an empirically testable proposition. And what Israelis have concluded is they traded land and they got no peace. And so it made any bargain between Israel and the Palestinians harder, and the choices that Hamas made about governance have impoverished the people of Palestine and made their politics completely seize up. So, you know, they, they've made their own bed, and, and I absolutely agree with you about the pernicious consequences of their choices. I... On the policy prescription, though, I don't think that Egypt was the major or even a major source of support for Hamas. I think the Iranians are to blame for that. I think Bashar al-Assad in Syria is to blame for that. But I at least didn't see a major pipeline of Egyptian support. And, in fact, the Egyptians had closed down the smuggling tunnels 
uh, by which the Palestinians had tried to subvert Israeli control. So there were some positive signs that the Muslim Brotherhood didn't feel itself beholden to support Hamas. But we've got a big problem. The Israelis have got a big problem. Um, and that big problem is that the Palestinians essentially have a dead-end attitude, which is, you know, they want all the concessions to be made by the stronger side. <laughs> and that's just an improbable outcome. So I... I think we're going to be stuck where we are on on Palestinian issues until this generation of leadership passes, because they're sclerotic, yeah. and the Israelis, and we in assisting the Israelis, need to protect them as best they can, because the situation, I think, is frozen in amber for a while. But it's a very you good could point. help manage it by, by preventing Bashar al-Assad from having the ability to help them, by by constantly drawing attention to what in Iran is doing. You know, we the Obama administration acts like the Iranian nuclear program is the only concern, the only issue we have to deal with. So they don't care about democracy inside Iran. They don't care about Iran's very overt terrorism in Latin America, the attempt to kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington. They, we need to be consistently calling out the Iranians and making sure our friends and allies that are also affected by this are. And that's another of the real leadership failures of the Obama administration. Corey, do you have a few more minutes? I have just a couple, and then I have to run. Okay, real quick. Yeah, I know you've been with us so long. It's been a fabulous conversation. I just wanted to mention two things because you brought Iran into the conversation. I think you're absolutely right. Iran has much deeper issues, and I wanted to just point to them as an example. They just held an election, which you know could be played off as look, they have a democracy. They had an election, and they voted in another, uh, you know, uh, person. But we could say, okay, look, the truth is that the people who were allowed to run were set in place by the uh, mullahs and the uh, the you know right. the power broker. So it wasn't really a true democracy. Yeah, so we, we understand that, but I think large parts of the world don't see it the same way. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, Rouhani may turn out to be Iran's Gorbachev, but he came to power in the same way, which is that the powerful brokers in this awful Iranian regime thought he was safe enough to put it ahead of the apparatus. Um and I hope they turn out to be wrong. I hope he turns out to have a vision for an Iran where the rule of law constrains the powerful. Uh, but I don't see any sign of it just yet. No, I think that's just right. I, look, we all pray that at some point in the future that the Middle East will start reverting back to an area that could be uh, flourishing and, and safe and, and where people – could actually go about normal life like they do in other parts of the world because, quite frankly, I think yeah. there's so many places that have been such in such upheaval and you know such chaos that oh, you just pray for something better there for the Palestinian yeah, people too. Yeah, exactly. Not- that is that is such a beautiful perspective on it that you wish them better that they have and that you send it in prayer is actually a beautiful, tolerant thing to do. Makes me joyful. It's why I like talking to you guys so much. Thank you very much for having me on again. Oh, and we, we do as well. And thank you so much for taking so much time today. Corey, it's been great, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, good. I look forward to it. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Take care. And that was uh, Corey Shockey with the Hoover Institute. And, uh, boy, did I, I know I kept her for an awful long time. So I'll have to send her flowers.